Good morning, Concord. Let's stand up and sing this morning. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. And now every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. my failures and flaws Lord you've seen them all and you still call me free cause the God of the mountains is the God of the valleys and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again
Amen. Oh, yeah. And we are glad that you're with us, excited. If you are a visitor with us this morning, welcome. Thanks for being a part of the family. We would love for you to see us in the lobby immediately following service uh, to receive a gift from us. And there's actually a QR code in the seat in front of you. If you want to scan that and uh, share with us a little bit of information about uh, who you are and, and find out a little bit about us, that would be fantastic. Uh, let me talk to uh, all the guys for the second. Uh, all the guys say, uh, uh-huh. Uh huh. Wonderful. Hey, Thursday night, we have backyard games with the boys. You guys are going to be there, right? Uh huh. Okay, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Uh, uh, we're cooking all the burgers, all the dogs. That will be provided for you. If you bring a side, look, a bag of chips will work. Uh, so just come on out, hang out. We're going to play a bunch of games, have a great time together. No big agenda. We just want you to be able to get to know one another. Maybe meet somebody that you haven't met before. And uh, there's nothing guys like better than a little bit of competition. So uh, we're just going to have a great time together. So please come out. Ladies, make your man come. All right, tell him. You've got it covered. Go. Go hang out on Thursday night. Uh, coming up this summer is our VBS, and we would love for you to get involved. So if you are thinking about, or right now, I'm just placing it right on your heart right now, to be a uh, volunteer at VBS, uh, go on the website, click the little link, and uh, say you want to volunteer. Also, if you've got a, a, a child or you've got a neighbor that you want to get enrolled or a grandkid, uh, you can register on that link on the website or in the Church Center app. We would love to uh, do VBS with you this summer. It's an all-church. You probably have heard before, uh, VBS is an all-church event. Uh, it takes all of us preparing, planning uh, to be a part of that. So if you are at all interested, and maybe you, you can't be a worker all uh, four nights of VBS, but you want to help, please talk to Pastor Dustin, and there will be a way, I promise, for you to help. Uh, today we are excited. We told you last week, and you probably read it this week, uh, we're going to be talking to the Adoption Project today. The Adoption Project is us, uh, the Heralds. I uh, have a story, and uh, this has been going on for quite some time, and I am so excited for them to be able to share their heartbeat, what's happening through this project. And so uh, thank you for being here today. I promise you have come on a great day to hear what God is doing in and through this place. I hope that you have come ready with an open heart and an open mind for what God has for you this morning. We're going to go to the Lord right as we begin and receive tithes and offerings because we believe that our first act of faith is giving back to God. So would you bow your heads with me this morning? And ushers, if you would make your way forward. As we pray right now in this moment, I'm just going to invite you. I'm not really sure what your week looked like. I really have no idea what the week ahead has to hold for you. But I know the only thing that matters is that you are in the presence of God right now. Nothing that happened last week, nothing that's on the agenda. Take a breath this morning. Would you whisper a prayer to God that says, I'm here, I'm open, and I'm available to you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, we are so grateful to be in your presence today. We are excited and we have come into this place with anticipation of what you have for us today. God, I pray that our worship would truly be an act of worship, an opportunity to love you back for the way that you love us. Help us to worship completely this morning. Lord God, I pray that as we hear about opportunities for what you are doing in our community, God, that we will see with your eyes how we can be a part of your journey. Lord God, I'm thankful for my family. I pray for those right now that are struggling. We have some that are in the hospital, some that are sick right now in this moment. God, I pray that you would pull close to them even right now, that you would just be there and that they can feel your presence in a brand new way. Well, God, we love you so much. We pray this in your son, Jesus Christ's name and all my family said. Worship 
the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing Would you pray this prayer with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. I'm born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. I trust in God, my Savior.
sing this together. So come. Maybe seated. My entire life, I've wanted to adopt. Adoption and foster care was part of the very fabric of their small group. I was adopted as an infant. My parents brought me home when I was a month old. We talked about it early on when we started dating about how important adopting would be for us and our family. I'm a parent to three adopted children we adopted from foster care. We chose to adopt because um, when we started um, this journey to, to have children, um, we struggled. Kind of reached that point of spending a lot of money with fertility treatments. I wanted to serve kids in my community. And I said, there, there's a kid out there who needs a home. The hardest part of the adoption process, one, the time frame, it just, it took so long. Our adoption process, start to finish, was about a year and a half about three years. Two to three years. Two, it costs so much. Someone from the home state, I said, well, what, what does this even cost? And she's like, well, it could be 20,000. If you go private, it could be 100. And I'm like, I wonder if I can get a second mortgage on the house. We spent $42,000 on our adoption process, more than $30,000. $55,000. Three, was the uncertainty of it all. And they connected us with um, what we thought was an agency. Um, turned out it was a facilitator based in California. At one point in the process, we lived in the NICU for almost a week. That anxiety when you're waiting to finalize the paperwork, especially when you already have this wonderful little child in your arms, is just nightmarish. Once Jake was born and we were in Virginia holding him, um, that's when we really learned the reality that facilitators were not licensed. That placement ultimately fell through. It was a really, really hard time for our family. The moment of panic we had from dealing with, um, with that situation and the things that we learned working in that facilitator situation um, has forever impacted us. The goal of adoption 
should be putting that child in the best place possible for the child. I'm so grateful to be a big sister through adoption. Simply put, adoption means everything to our family. It means an expansion of unconditional love in a way that perhaps you would be able to understand had you not lived it. It's the, the greatest blessing that we've ever received. Adoption for our family has brought a new level of love and appreciation and, and patience. <laughs> I promise, as someone who has been through this experience on both sides, that if you can be there in that moment of grace, it'll change how tomorrow works for you. Would you welcome uh, the Heralds this morning? It sounds funny to say because you are us, um, but what you are doing through the Adoption Project, we talked um, uh, a little while ago about uh, when even praying through the launching of what the Adoption Project was going to look like. And um, so this morning, we just want to hear a little bit for those that maybe don't know you um, and don't know what the Adoption Project is. But more importantly, as we begin, I wanted to just kind of talk about this need for adoption. Could you share, I mean, you've obviously done a lot of work and uh, to, to kind of rearrange your lives and to do the Adoption Project. Share with us why adoption is important, why there's a need for adoption. This is going to be an emotional morning. That's all right. That's all right. We will make it through together. Um, yeah, so we kind of looked at this in two buckets. didn't start that way. started uh, just looking at our own experience, which was private, um, domestic adoption, infant adoption. Uh, but then learned more and started learning about the foster care system. And in a nutshell, okay. uh, if you look both internationally and domestically, kind of across the arc of time over the last 20 years, the number of adoptions have gone down, particularly in um, domestic and international adoptions on the private side. Now that's for a variety of reasons, um, a lot of them socioeconomic, uh, but the other parts of that are um, China, for example, is it the one China policy, or one child policy in China, and so um, families weren't abandoning kids as often, particularly little, little girls or kids with disabilities uh, there. And so uh, that, and then the other side of it is we don't have kind of in this country anymore what you traditionally think of as orphanages. We've right. gone away from institutionalization, which is good. Yeah. It's good that we don't that we do not do that anymore. So there's a kind of that piece over there. But when you look at the foster care side, uh, kind of it, it just flips, right? And so the number of kids The number of kids in care has increased. It's uh, I think we're about eight or nine thousand okay. just in Tennessee now. Okay. Kids who are in foster care system at any given time it has gotten as high as eleven, uh, so it'll fluctuate back and forth. There are what was the number they told us uh, Tuesday? About four hundred fifty about uh, kids who are in foster care who uh, their parents' rights have been terminated. Right, so they're eligible to be adopted, to right. join a permanent family. So you're just looking for family. Yeah. Right. So the need is great. Yeah, and that's just, that's just here, right? Yeah. That's not across the country. That's just in Tennessee. So 450 kids uh, in the system now who need a permanent family. Now, those are often older kids as well. Which is important so. because the Adoption Project right now uh, is currently trying to change the face of adoption in the state of Tennessee. And that's what you guys kind of set out to do. Um, you guys are adoptive parents. Uh, will you share with us why? Uh, your adoption story. Um, our second or third date. First. This is our first date? First. Okay. But this our is not marriage date. counseling. Okay, this is... <laughs> Very early on in our dating life. There you go. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, we had a conversation about adoption um, and both felt like we had a heart for that and had no idea what that would look like in our future, but it was something that we both felt pulled to. And then we kind of put that away and went on and dated and got married and 
had Wesley, and it was just always kind of something there. Um, and then about six or seven years ago now, um, it, the Lord just kind of brought it back, like, okay, it's time to start thinking about this. Um, and so we started the process of applying. Um, our adoption agency knows more about us than our own families do. <laughs> it's a very invasive, extensive process. Um, and then we waited. And then we met um, three different moms in that process. Um, and they all chose to go different routes that were not us. Okay. Um, and we had actually had a conversation about, like, did we, did we misunderstand? Yeah. That is this not what we were supposed to do? Um, and then are we, we need to put an end date on this at some point. Um, and then in the middle of 2020, when nobody was going anywhere or doing anything, um, we got a phone call. And we had a Zoom meeting with a young woman um, in Cleveland who had just had a little baby girl. And as we're talking with her and getting to know her a little bit, I see her write something on a piece of paper and show it to the, the friends that were there with her on the Zoom meeting. And the woman said, oh, you gotta show them that. You need to show them that. And she held up a piece of paper to the screen and it said, this is the family. Mm. Three weeks later, we made a trip in the middle of a hurricane <laughs> flowing through. Um, and we brought, we brought Miss Ruby home. And if you've met her, it's been a whirlwind. <laughs> <laughs> And then when we began not only parenting our daughter, we continued to build a relationship with her mom and got to know her and got to spend time with Brooke um, in various settings. She's been to our house, we've been to hers. Um, and when Ruby was about 11 months old, she sent me a text and she was like, I think I'm pregnant. And walked through that of what was she going to do? Was she going to parent? Was she going to place this child? And she called me one day and she said, can't do it, and I don't want them to not be together. Mm. And we said, well, we feel the same. Um, and she, she's a remarkable woman and very gracious. Um, and so I got to be there when Rosie entered the world. Oh, wow. Um, and now we have two little girls. Um, was it everything you expected it to be? <laughs> <laughs> no. How so? Um, I was, I, there, man, there's a lot here. Uh, <laughs> some of this I was thinking about for a later point in this conversation, but I might go ahead and do it now. Uh, the, the first, the thing that immediately jumps out in my mind when you ask me that question was, so we, um, Ruby came home from Chattanooga and so we were driving down there and, you know, oh, it's this is awesome. We're going to pick up our baby. Sure. She's coming home and da da da, da Everything's so great. So we walked, in the <laughs> we walked in the door to the agency. And um, I hadn't even thought about this. But their mom was there. Like mm. She was standing there holding when we came in. She literally, you know, we talk about... <laughs> We talk about placing a child for adoption. She literally placed the baby in the shell's arms. Wow. Like, very literally. And there's this instant when the switch flips in your brain and you realize that one of the happiest days of our life is the worst day of somebody else. Mm. at the very same time. Yeah. Related to the very same issue. And so that was, <laughs> uh, that was probably the most unexpected uh, thing. I might shut up and let you talk. <laughs> or not, I'll keep going. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us, so that was unexpected. Yeah. And, but how does, how has adoption impacted you now? Like, you know, you, you felt this calling, you, you not wrestled with it, but God reminded it, you know, to you later and you've gone through this extensive process mm -hmm. and now you're here. So how has it, how has it impacted your life 
being adoptive parents? I think for me, it's made me aware of story and how important that is to everybody, but particularly for my girls, um, that they know from day one their story. Um, I'm very, very grateful that we have a relationship with their birth mom. Um, that was something that was completely terrifying in the beginning. When we sat in the first meeting with our agency, they said, you know, we, we require you to have some sort of open relationship with birth family. And we left that meeting and thought, I don't know about that. <laughs> that seems really scary. Yeah. Um, and through thinking and praying, I read um, some books and um, came to the realization that that maybe is not so scary. We can try that. Um, and then we got into it. And it was just, like, like Jeremy said, she, she literally placed her child in my arms. And having a a biological child of my own, I can't imagine mm. placing him in someone else's arms and taking my hands off. Um, and she did. And we've continued to get to know her and our girls know her. Mm. Um, Ruby will tell you she was in Brooke's belly. Mm -hmm. um, and that they know that part of their story yeah. um, and who they are and where they come from. Um, and the, the, important of being, the importance of being honest with them how did your story, um, talking about stories, how did your story lead you to what you're doing now? How did it lead into, you, you, you didn't set out to do this. You had uh, a career of your own. Yeah. You were going in one direction. Uh, you've gone through adoption. And then it seems like it was a little bit after the adoption that God started to kind of stir in your heart. But how did your story lead to what you're doing now? Yeah, a couple of, the, uh, so I'm going to overlay Michelle's story yeah. <laughs> about kind of the, the things that we'd gone through and we had some that didn't work out um, with, to your point, had a professional career. Yeah. By any outside view, pretty successful, sure. I would say. Um, but there was even b before Ruby. There was something in there that was just, um, I don't know what the right word is, but um, I was just unsettled okay. about it. And to the point that one time be before pandemic, mm -hmm. one time, like there was this, I was having a conversation with somebody and it was like, I, I, I almost, I had been praying about it, and I almost jumped ahead of the Lord. And they were like, well, are you sure that's wise? <laughs> are you sure that's the right thing to do right now? And so I took a step back, but I kept praying about it. And it would have talked about, we were singing this morning, um, I sought the Lord, and he heard and he answered. Okay. Now, for a year or two, that answer was, not yet. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's not time. Yeah. And then kind of in this process, I found myself complaining one day, again, just about all the differences and all the questions and how much money it costs. It mm. costs too much money and it yeah. takes too long and all these things. And that person said to me, both of these people have me to church here, by the way, but uh, that person said to me, uh, well, if you think it's so much stuff, why don't you do something about it? Well, then the realization of that starts to set in, and it's like, well, wait a minute. We're pretty settled over here. <laughs> We're pretty secure. Yeah. This is going to be a gigantic risk. Um, and so I set it to the side again, but kept praying about it. And then, and in part because I just couldn't make the math work on it. Yeah. I just can't make the math work on this. And so one day, after Ruby is home, at this point, um, in my personal, just my personal Bible study reading, I'd been going through uh, Nehemiah, right? And so, in a nutshell, uh, Nehemiah is the, he's, he's an Israelite, they're in captivity in Babylon. He's the servant of the king of Babylon. 
the most trusted servant, like the right hand, is what the scripture says. And, um, so in, <laughs> in one part, you think, well, he's got to be thinking, why am I doing this? I'm, I'm the highest servant to this guy who's holding my people in slavery, right? All my friends and family. Well, some other Israelites come back from Jerusalem, and they're telling him these stories about the state of the city and how the walls have fallen. Mm. And he's just overcome yeah. with this grief about it. And so uh, he prays, <laughs> he seeks the Lord, and the Lord says, well, like, that's what happened for you, right? That's your job. And so <clears throat> he goes into the hand ringing, wait a minute now, how am I supposed to do this? <laughs> That doesn't make any sense. Why is it me? And the Lord keeps telling him, and he goes to, uh, finally, he's like, okay, okay, I get it. So he does the only thing he knows to do at that point. He goes to the king and tells him, the Lord says, I'm, I'm supposed to go rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the walls. And the king says, the king who has let Jerusalem fall apart and is holding the people in slavery says well you're my most trusted servant just tell me what you need hmm. do you know that? i'm gonna put you on the spot and you don't have to know it do you know the answer he gets, tells him two things do you know what those are uh no not right now i don't <laughs> no. he I says failed. no Sorry. no no that's nobody knows the answer to this question and i didn't know until i kind of put it together again but um he says i need uh, essentially i need money and i need credibility okay right i need the finances to rebuild the wall, I have to pay for it, Yeah, and I need a letter from you that says I can go anywhere in your kingdom. Money and credibility. I thought, well, that's what I need. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so I, at that point, it's like, okay. We start putting a plan together. Start making some phone calls to the kings and former kings <laughs> and, and those sorts of things, right? We can all put those together about who those people are and um, just really gracious and generous in that way. Do you feel like um, do you feel like you were you already possess some of the gifts from God mm -hmm. to be able to do this? And then in that process, as you were in that devotion, as you were reading, do you feel like God was just kind of opening up and saying, "You you already have these things. You already have this giftedness to be able to proceed forward." Yes, He does. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I think I think you know what you said is is for a lot of us we might not be being called uh, to this, but you felt called to this. You sought the Lord through that calling, and then God responded to you and said, "I've actually already equipped you to do this." And I think that's important for a lot of us to know that when God begins to pull on our heartstrings and say, "This need that you are identifying, this thing that you see in your life, um, the way that you saw adoption." If we will go to the Lord, more often than not, we will see we have already actually been gifted to proceed in that, and he's waiting on that step of faithfulness. So you guys took that step of faithfulness, gifts that you had already received from God, um, to enter into something where you just, you left your job, <laughs> you uh, totally followed his calling, and stepped out into the adoption project. So... Uh, as you entered into that and you know it has begun to evolve and grow to where we're at now what are you in a in a holy pride sort of way what are you most proud of that you have seen happen after stepping out and saying okay god i'm gifted i'm going to follow your ways now how long has adoption projects been here two years so in two and a half years there's probably many things but if you would say, this is one thing that I thought, wow, I'm so glad I took this step of faith. Yeah, so we, um, a, a lot of people, don't a lot of people, I'd probably say most everybody, uh, doesn't understand exactly what it is we do. Yeah. Um, so we're not, like, I'm not recruiting foster parents, and I'm not building houses, and I'm not uh, giving book bags away or things like that. Yeah. Like, what we do is 
we talk to the folks who are doing those things mm. and ask them, okay, well, what do you see? What's the issue? What's the problem yeah. that needs to be solved in your, to make your job easier? And so because we're not stepping on their toe, right? We're not trying to invade their kingdom, so to speak. They're really willing to give us information. And I say that to say, so then we take that information and we go try to change the law, right? Yeah. Or change the, whatever the department policy or both on the public side and the private side. And so the, the arc of that is really long. Right, the, just the way that all works is really one. You have to go to the legislative process and then it all has to get implemented, et cetera, et cetera. So all that to say, we're just now getting to the point where things we did two years ago, sure, somebody can come back and say, hey, here's what I, what I saw. Yeah. And so You're saying me, it takes a little time in government for things to happen. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Understood. Um, okay, I'm following now. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And so, but it, just recently I've had a, a couple of things that people have said uh, just in passing. Like I, we did, we did some work to change the timelines. Okay. And like I know that there are kids in this state whose adoption is finalized. They are permanently in their family. Yeah. Who wouldn't be. Hmm. Like I know that. Yeah. I know that that has happened because the folks who are handling those cases told me that's done. I, uh, another thing we did is, I'm not gonna get into the details of this because it's complicated, but there's some processes by which uh, neglect cases when, a, when termination happens in the foster care system. In certain circumstances, there were times when those were automatically retried in the higher court. Automatically, yeah. not just on appeal, they were okay. automatically retried. So we were like, well, no, wait a minute. All those things don't have to be done that way. You should be able to if you need to, but it doesn't have to be done Okay. that way. I got a text message two weeks ago from an attorney who's like, this, and somebody might think this is the opposite of what we were going for, but it's not. It's exactly what we are going for. Like, there's a little boy who's living with his dad today, mm. not getting drugged through another court case. Yeah. Um, and then as I think, oh, there's a, a, another, sorry, uh, another person. He's a, a young man who uh, is in his mid-20s now, adopted. He reached out because he had been in uh, one of my former bosses' classes okay, uh, and saw it. We were connected, and so he reached out. I was like, hey, I want to tell you my story. And we had a gr I love talking to people because everybody's story is different. Um, and he said, hey, here's what's going on, and asked what our story was. And so I told him about this relationship that we had with Brooke, the girl's birth mom. And that was probably eight months ago. About <laughs> over Easter, right after Easter, I got an email from him that said, hey, I emailed my birth mom, and we had dinner Easter weekend. Wow. And so that's, that, that's not actually anything we did other than just encouragement. Sure. Right? But the, the restoration that you can see happen, mm. when you can identify a specific thing that needs to be better. Yeah. And go make that thing better. <laughs> those are some of the things. That, I mean, there's been a lot, actually. We got a lot done in two years, but... Um, those are the ones that kind of stand out in my mind. Is there anything maybe looking forward? One of the things that I think looking forward um, is how can we as an organization show love to those women who have literally placed their children um, in other people's arms and how can we let them know that they are seen mm. and they are loved and that I'm never going to understand, but I can show up. How can Concord help? What can we do? You've filled us full of information. You've shared your story. Um, I think God does have to lay on your heart um, for adoption 
Um, and I think there may be some that the Lord is laying it on their heart for adoption, but there are probably a number in this room that adoption is not what God has laid on their heart, but is there some way that they can still help this process? The need is great, um, and they want to get involved. How can they get involved? Say, uh, I put you on the platform, the, go for it. The, put that mic uh, up there. I, I'm going to start with... Um, the heart for adoption in this church and foster care to a different extent. Yeah. It's pretty great to the point that, like, like I said, everybody has their stories and some people like to share them and some people don't. And I, but I, I mean, I know there, from people who have come and talked to me, there are multiple adult adoptees in our church. Mm. Multiple. There are multiple adoptive families in our church yeah. to the point that it's probably eight months or a year ago, I was just, when our girls were both still in the nursery, I always wish I could talk to them. And I would, I, I just peeked in the window. You just want to get out of the sermon. No but, no, but just the people that I knew. Yeah. Right? It's like, I know this, I know this. It was something like 40, did the math real quick, something like 40% of the kids in the nursery came into their family through adoption wow. on that particular day. Yeah. Um, we have a lot, a lot. Uh, and then we have some foster care connections to not, I, I don't actually know of anybody who's a foster parent through um, the official like DCS, the department system, the state system or provider, but through some um, independent providers that the state's not engaged in. Uh, I do know that. And so in, including we've done a few short terms as well. The Okay, a couple, couple of ways now to be more specific. One, I think when we talked, I told you that there are 9,000 9, kids roughly in foster care. Yeah. There are about 5,800 foster families, right? yeah. which means there are multiple kids in some houses. That's official foster kid, kids sure. in foster care, not the non-state placements. Um, Now, that means there are multiple kids in some homes, some of their siblings. Sure. Right? That's a good thing to happen. But you always need more families. But I think what I said to you is we would be doing people a disservice if we asked people as a church community, if we asked people to sign up to be foster parents without first putting in place the infrastructure to support them and mm -hmm. what they were going to do, whether that is um, – through food and uh, diapers and yeah. that sort of thing, or whether it is through babysitting and that kind of thing, or through some sort of respite program. Now, I'm gonna take a step back and put in a pitch here. To like, we have a respite program that uh, people should be volunteering to participate in. Uh, called recess. It's not for kids in foster care, it's for children with disabilities. But like if you've never done that, like that is the easiest volunteer work and the most fun volunteer work you will ever do. Um, and so you should, I would encourage you to just take the step there. It's not scary. I know it feels scary. It was scary for me when we first decided to start doing it. But after that very first, on that very first night, I was like, oh no, this is, this is easy. This is fun and this is easy. We can do this. Um, so I would encourage people to do that. But that's the kind of thing that you need. And then from there, move into this idea of um, how do we recruit people within the foster care system, either like official long-term placements, or if you can't do that, short-term placements yeah. through, uh, there's a program called Safe Families for Children uh, that the state, that's not a state-based program. It's a program called Jonah's Journey. Uh, that are intended to be limited time, short-term placements for kids who are separated from their parents uh, with the intent of putting those families back together and yeah. just providing that, that short-term. It's really important. Um, I, th uh, I think that sometimes we 
two things. We have one, we have this view of adoption that it's like, there are some people who have this view of adoption, that it's um, in foster care that oh, we are putting this kid in a better place, hmm. right? Our first goal is to be preserving a family unit. Yeah. And then if we if we can't immediately preserve it, then we should restore it. Okay. Reunify it. Yeah. When we can. Then when we can't do that, we find a permanent family for that that's child through adoption or our guardianship. And that's really good. That's where our heart needs to be, but we on on the flip side of that, right? We have this view of adoption that it is, um, like I said, we're driving to Chattanooga, right? Oh, this is great, it's so awesome. This baby's joining our family, this baby needs a family. We have a place in our home and we wanna be a family for this baby and it's great. I, <laughs> I'm a person who likes to hear everything in the manner in which it was intended. I try my best, I fail sometimes. <laughs> but I try my best to hear everything in the manner in which it was intended. And so I, I get this text message from her. We get lots of text messages like this, but one specific one that stands out in my mind. It was, um, oh man, that's so great. That baby hit the jackpot. <laughs> when she found you guys. And I thought, I, I hope we live up to that. But even if she did, she had to lose the closest connection she ever had yeah. to get to that spot. And so, and I probably should have started with this. I can only share our perspective and what people share with me. Mm -hmm. There's so much connection here. And these guys may have a different perspective on it all and that's yeah. okay. <laughs> Right. Um, everybody may have a di not everyone. We're probably going to share some very common things, but um, if you have a different view, that's okay. And I'd love to talk to you about it and hear your perspective on it and how, um, why that is, because I can learn from it. Right. And so maybe in sharing your different experience you can affect something else that might get changed in the future yeah. in a way that kind of honors that as well. I would say this. Um, you have given us a really beautiful, brutal view of adoption that oftentimes we don't get. Um, we, uh, we don't get the, the nitty gritty of the adoption story. And um, I just wanna thank you for that for educating a number of us that adoption is something that we're still unfamiliar with, we want to know more about. Um, you've given us a beautiful picture of that. I also want to say, as I started from the very beginning and said, you guys are us, um, that we are so thankful, grateful for your story and the way you've stepped out. And it is an encouragement to us as a church of what it looks like to be obedient and then see God bless obedience. Um, this was your story. There's a lot of stories that are represented here today that I think a God is just waiting on a step of obedience and that maybe this is an encouragement for some of us today to just say, what might happen if you did take that step of faithfulness? What change might you be able to see happen uh, really in a real world? I know there's information that you guys were able to put on the chairs for us today. Um, if you want to know more information about the Adoption Project, you can scan their QR code. It takes you to a number of stories and opportunities and resources for you to know what Adoption Project is doing. But the better source is right here. And if you want to know more about uh, Adoption Project, about um, what they're learning, what you can be a part of, what you can do, then uh, I can promise you that Michelle and Jeremy are always uh, willing to share uh, what's going on, how you can be effective, and what you can do. Church, this is the church being the church. 
uh, it's so vitally important that we pray together and say, God, your kingdom come, your will be done. We don't just repeat that as an old dead prayer. It is our hope as Concord community that we are seeing God's kingdom come and his will be done and through whatever way God asks us to move and to be obedient. If I could add one thing yeah. to what you said about um, if we, if, if the Lord's telling you to do something, like what would happen if we all listen to what, and that's not pointed at me, by the way, it's like I fail to listen often. Um, but my encouragement would be, if the Lord's telling you to do something, as scary as it might be, mm-hmm. he's, he's not standing behind you pushing you toward it. He's already on the other side of it. There you go. Like, he's, he's not here saying, go do this. He's standing over there waiting for you. Mm. It's beautiful. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for being the sermon today. Thank you for sharing us your heart. Will you do this with me this morning? Will you bow your heads? And I'm just going to ask you this morning, if you would just extend your hands towards Jeremy and Michelle this morning, and let's pray for what they continue to do and what God is doing in and through them. Heavenly Father, God, we are thankful for what it looks like to see testimony lived out of obedience, what it looks like to take a step of faith. God, we understand that the the need is large, um, that Adoption is not just a word, it's thousands of faces of children that are in situations that need some assistance. And that uh, through uh, this step of faith, that we're seeing assistance happen and we're seeing um, children taken care of. God, you called us to, uh, to be there specifically for widows and orphans what better way to see your kingdom come and your will be done than to continue on in understanding, making change, and making it easier to be able to fulfill what you have asked us to do. God, encourage us today to take our own step of faith. That vision, uh, help it to burn into our minds that you are standing there, not pushing, but waiting for us to come to you to receive what it is that you have for us. God, we are thankful for Jeremy and Michelle, and we ask that you would continue to bless them, God, as they raise their own family, as they raise their own children, but as they continue to seek ways to unite other families. Lord God, we pray all this in your son, Jesus Christ's name, and all my family said. I renounce the lie that I don't measure up. I renounce the lie I'm unworthy of your love. And when shame comes knocking and fear starts talking, I will lift my hands in your presence. You remind me whose I am. I am adopted. I am beloved, it's my inheritance, I'm a child of God. So when the liar starts mouthing off, I'll sing in confidence my adoption song. Whoa, whoa, adoption song I rebuke the spirit that tried to keep me bound and I plead the blood of Jesus the accuser has no ground and my future's given blame is written in his nail scarred hands and forevermore I'll know whose I am I'm a child.
child of God. So when the liar starts mouthing all, I sing in confidence my adoption song. It's my inheritance. I'm a child of God. So when the liar starts mouthing off, I'll sing in confidence my adoption song. Let's stand up and read this benediction together. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. We love you guys. Have a great week.